one <laughs> review where we are doing sequels <laughs> of an artist. And we are doing Joni Mitchell, The Hissing of Summer Lawns. Uh, we have done two other Joni Mitchell albums to this point, And I believe we do a fourth one later down the road, correct? We do. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, Matt, you're probably going to take this segment to start. So two things. Can you run mm -hmm. the other two albums that we have talked uh, about Joni Mitchell? Uh, about that are yes. Joni Mitchell albums, and then uh, put the numbers for us too. So yeah, we covered uh, in this season uh, in a proper episode. We covered Joni Mitchell's 1971 album Blue. That was a proper episode with a full bio. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one that we do in a full full bio for uh, for Joni Mitchell. We also covered in a previous cold listen Court and Spark from 1974, and a little little later we're going to be doing Hejra Hejira. I think Hejira. 1976. Hegira, yeah. Hegira, yeah. whatever. Um, that'll be uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever. That is uh, another going to be another cold listen. And tonight, uh, the hissing of the summer lawns, which comes in on best ever albums number one seventy in the nineteen seventies, mm. number twelve in nineteen seventy five, number seven forty four of all time. And on Rolling Stone's list, it comes in at number two fifty eight. It is Joni Mitchell's fourth highest rated album on Best Ever Albums, and it is the highest rated album we are covering tonight. So hmm, this okay. is the best one, according, according to, to the rankings. According to yeah. Rolling Stone, right? So we're, we're, we're No, well, also according to Best Ever. I don't know about oh, Rolling Stone. According to Best Ever Albums. So, okay, gotcha. I, I didn't, ca I didn't uh, do those chronological uh, okay. Rolling Stone list, but this one is Best Ever Albums, best album gotcha. of the evening. So we're coming in hot. Well, and that is, of course, a compilation of reviews, critics and magazines Correct, and right. publications. So this is the consensus thought there. So, Matt, what is your consensus thought? I hate Joni Mitchell. <laughs> oh. I'm just I'm just getting so <laughs> sick of Joni Mitchell. I just I try. I thought I was going to like I was like, all right, let's open it up a little bit. Um, I, I liked the second song on this. That was Same. a surprise. Yes. I thought that was that sounded like a St. Vincent song. Throw, this was throw a, me in as a third there. I yeah. really love that song. The Jungle Line is the name of the song. Uh, it starts off with In France, They Kiss on Main Street, which is kind of, you know, one of those. You know, it's not surprising. It's a, like a 70s soft rock kind of song. It's smooth. That was one of the first words that came to mind. It's a smooth, you know, electric yep. piano, soft also. rock, you know, um, bit dated. Guitar tone was kind of decent on that. So I was like, okay, that's all right. And uh, the jungle line came on and totally threw me off. I was like, okay, so Joni Mitchell is being experimental. Mm -hmm. It's got this African drumming. It's this strange eclectic instrumentation. And yeah, St. Vincent was, was the artist that kind of came to mind listening to this. And I thought this was very different. This is the most, I don't know, avant-garde Joni Mitchell song that we've gotten or most abstract. It just Definitely. was, it was very different and I liked it. I was like, okay. The third song I got, Edith and the Kingpin, more of a soft rock tune, you know, very 70s, kind of easy listening type stuff. Reminded me a little Crosby, Stills and Nash, mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of a little bit of a bounce to it. The Laurel Canyon kind of sound is coming back here. There's a decent groove in there. And then I was like, okay, song number four is going to be back to the back to the indie rock type stuff. And no, nope, you don't really get that. You get Don't Interrupt the Sorrow. You know, it's got some bongo drums, um, you know, just, you know, but then it doesn't really go back to which, whatever she was doing in song two, which is a disappointment for me. This is just, you know, by the, what is it? By the seventh track, the boho dance, I, my last comment of Han here was I'm just getting <laughs> sick of Joni Mitchell. And it's just, I, I, she's not for me. You know what I mean? I know people love her. And um, again, maybe this album has amazing lyrics. It wouldn't surprise me if they did. Um, you know, if it did this, you know, Joni Mitchell is known for, for her lyrics and her confessional mm -hmm. nature of, of her songs. As we all know, I don't really care too much about that. As long as the music's there, that's my main thing. And um, I just, I found this boring. And the longer it went on, the, the, more, the more sick of it I got. I kind of felt myself towards the end of this album feeling similar to the way I did when I heard the Aretha Franklin uh, gospel album. Hmm. which was just was longer right took you know but it was a similar kind of feeling by song six seven eight nine and ten i was just next next i had kind of written them off before i'd even heard them i had heard enough by the sixth song and um was just they she teased me a little bit i thought i was going to get some really cool experimental Joni mitchell stuff and she really only did that with the second track and um 
I'm sorry. She's just not my thing. I think that I'm starting to feel like she's my most overrated artist of the of the decade. I, mm. I, I got to go with that. And, and Rolling Stone loves her, and apparently a lot of other people do. And like I've said before, I'm glad she's out there because she's inspired a lot of other musicians to create music. And I'm sure that she's inspired plenty of people that I really like. And so I'm thankful for that. But I personally, I'm not going to be listening to much Joni Mitchell, probably. I'll, I guess I'll have to listen to Hegira, and I will do so with an open mind. Maybe she'll get back to that experimental uh, you know mm-hmm. indie rock type stuff but uh yeah man i'm just i am not feeling joni mitchell all right so i was looking up on matt was talking a little bit so blue came out in 71 court and spark mm-hmm. came out in 74 and this came out in 75 i don't know if she produced stuff in between that we didn't cover but th- her sound has not evolved too much since we heard her in blue which was was it her debut album i think so right or one of her uh, i think it's her uh, no, second, it wasn't her, uh, second album yeah it wasn't okay. her debut album but yeah so yeah like you i was i was um really excited sorry, by four, jungle fourth album sorry i just wanted to oh wow there. okay fourth album. so yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so she she is really t- tethered um you know either by choice or 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 not to um to kind of her her singing with the folk the folk acoustic guitar. I think that's the backbone of everything. I think I kind of said that in Court and Spark too. I thought in Court and Spark that she was trying to um, branch out more. She had a bigger production there. And this almost seems a little bit like she's going backwards um, from Court and Spark. She, I think the production is less, um, you know, less, uh, less big. Um, there's less instrumentation involved, less production, I think. Um, although it still sounds good it's just she's not like trying the different styles like i think in court and spark we heard some country country numbers and some different things like that and and outside of um jungle line which i think matt you didn't mention i think that's like electronic instruments in there i think that's her yeah. her dabbling in that um yep. which is good i mean because we've been talking a lot about the electronic instruments and in synth that have come in i noticed it too on the last track actually shadows and light i think she has synth in there as well um or some sort of electronic instrument and she's like double tracking with herself or overdubbing her you know she's singing with herself however however she does that i think Um, it's like acapella that like the beginning and the the i don't know the first half of that song is just is mostly acapella yeah yeah. So so I like that too, but for for me this was a little bit of a letdown. I don't hate Joni Mitchell, but I don't she is not going to be somebody I I revisit or create a playlist of and give to some poor schmuck or something like that. <laughs> and um but yeah, so, so the the backbone sound with that folky guitar, she, she throughout most of the album like Matt said, she sticks to that. It's it's soft and gentle and and smooth and I didn't listen to the lyrics either um with one lesson i couldn't do that i think she is still kind of writing about the same things though um being being free not being tethered meeting men or a romance in some form or fashion and um and even when it seems like she has things like incorporating jazz elements um like maybe on hissing of summer lawns or harry's house and centerpiece slash centerpiece which almost transitions to a jazz number or some sort of like um, bar type of um, club number, but it's not bombastic or or like fast. It's more like a, she's singing on stage type of number. Um, It it still keeps to the themes of, of her, you know, previous lyrics and songs. So I don't, I'm curious as to why this is the highest rated one or what is, what is no, it? It's, people the, are... it's, it's it's well, it's the highest rated one that we're covering tonight. It's Joni well, Mitchell's fourth let, highest rated. Yeah, album. Let, jump let in. me jump. Let me jump in because I did listen to the lyrics, and this okay. is a very, very, very lyrically different album than her other albums. Oh, okay. This the, her other albums were very personally confessional. She was writing about herself as a subject. In this, she wrote much more in the Bob Dylan method of slice of life characters that mm. absolutely probably have shades of herself but were not at all direct um expository okay. pieces um a lot of hers like there's one about a woman in a loveless marriage she's not married at this point you know what i mean she's basically writing as a woman there's one mm. about a southern bell that's the shades of scarlet conquering that's 
the woman okay. imagines yeah. herself as Scarlett O'Hara and stuff like that. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of characters that in other albums that we've covered were her that in this one could be about her, but also could be about a feminine character in a different context that Joni Mitchell is as likely to have observed as she was mm-hmm. to have lived, if that makes sense. And so from that end of things, I connected lyrically with this album considerably more because I was able to also take a detached view like she was and be able to put in as opposed to the love and travails of Joni Mitchell, you know, like in a way that was so distinctly unique to her that I felt, I think I had mentioned in another review, I felt that um, it was difficult for me to connect because it was such a feminine album with such a feminine energy that I was listening almost like a voyeur as opposed to like a peer. You know, this one, even though it was still about the, the stories of women, right, it was done in a way where I could absolutely do it like I could literature, right, kind of yeah. in that sense um i also thought this was a more ambitious album musically uh yes there are some i mean Joni mitchell's voice which i think is a little bit of what drives matt crazy does kind of sound the same um on all these albums right the 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 general thing but you know what's interesting is that like there's other artists that you guys like like um Neil Young and Bob Dylan, who have a similar characteristic. It's just they, you know, they tweak it up and down. And and Joni Mitchell does that, too. It just might be sonically, maybe, that her sound doesn't do it as much as the others do. Um, for you, I'm thinking, maybe. I, I, I don't, don't have I don't have a problem with her voice, really. I don't find it no. grating or anything like that. I, I think it's just more of the guitar stuff that and kind of this traditional her mode of yeah, songs my my issue with her voice was more not so much in the tone of her voice, although sometimes it gets a little wearing. Is was more, and I didn't find it as much in this album, is in her previous albums trying to pack so much yes. in 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 very short verses right. or I bars, you that. and I just felt that she did that way too much, and it just was like in blue. I, I don't for know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and um, I felt like that this it was a little bit tempered here, um, so that didn't bother me yeah, as much she in was, this record. I didn't. I feel like she was pretty relaxed in her storytelling on I think this album i liked everything about this better i liked the musical choices because there was that african influence like you guys have talked about in jungle line i thought there was like the backing band i definitely liked it there was like backing instrumentation mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. i liked quite a bit yeah. um there was uh, some synthesizer which i don't remember in other um Joni mitchell um, not a t- and when i said this, not a ton by the no. way of stuff like that um I'm trying to, like, I think the synthesizer was it on track six and then the, one of the later ones, too. The last song um, had definitely had synthesizer so, on and it. Yeah, had, uh, yeah six, the last song. Six, mm-hmm. I was getting more of an electric piano. Did some, okay, maybe that, that's, that's what I was, yeah. yeah. That's the hissing of summer lawns for reference. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, lyrically, this was her best album, I think. It, well, I shouldn't say it was the, the best for me in terms of what I like in my lyrics. Yeah. Um, like Matt said, the, there didn't seem as much jammed in. It was a free, freer and easier singing. Um, it was also not the escalate like the escalator stuff as much as it was in earlier albums where she mm-hmm. was, you know, up and then down and up, you know, that kind of like at times would... Yeah. Um, be jarring for me um i just found this to be a much more pleasant listen um i get the feeling that her next album is going to sound extremely different than her Mm. early ones because i saw a marked change in this album from her other ones and i've always heard that like classic Joni mitchell and like late 70s Joni mitchell are very different animals like i I think she becomes a lot more experimental as it goes and i i am pretty sure i don't know this for a fact but i think like the jungle line and some of those things are the beginning of what her eventual stuff. I know she does, for example, like an album, like that uh, the Charles Mingus's last album, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think it's even called Mingus, you know, when he was in the throes of dying and stuff were with her. And I think she does world music and stuff as well. Yeah, so. she does. Yep. And yeah, more and with so, a full band and the African, you know, influence of African music and stuff. Is so more I'll be interested to see if we, because we both re- we all reacted to that song if we yeah. kind of further see that but uh for me i i actually would put this one in you know slightly a recommend which is higher than i did the other two albums this this one's my favorite by quite a bit mm. and um you know the thing that i that that stays is that Joni Mitchell writes unabashedly feminine songs about women um and that's very rare 
in the stuff where it's her and what Carol King, right? Like, I mean, yeah. and, and her songs, by the way, are not just love songs. Um, they were earlier, but now she's writing about like social issues and stuff like that too. Um, and yeah, I can see why she's such a powerful in, uh, influence on female singer songwriters because did Laura Nero do that too? Laura Nero did too. Yep. Yeah. And so it, okay. that was a sixties album. So, you know, oh, it was? I, I was saying, well, seven, shoot, uh, let's, I mean, yeah, Roberta Flack too, right. To some extent. If we're going to yes. throw other female singer songs oh, we talked I, about. I, I'm saying that there is no, to me, Joni Mitchell, make sure that you know hmm. that she is, that at no point does she try to take on like any, what you would call like masculine traits, right? And in that right. sense, like some of the other artists we talked about will occasionally veer into that and stuff with like either like, I, I just, it's hard to explain, but there is a femininity, yeah. an unabashed femininity like Lilith Fair type femininity, like in her albums that like, I, I don't see in too many other, the only other thing I can think is like tapestry, right? Did tap into that same idea and occasional songs from some of the other female, you know, like Carly Simon, Linda Ronstadt stuff, but they, they don't scream to me. Like to me, to some degree, they're still being dictated to by their male counterparts, you know, and that's part of what the struggle they're talking about. At no point do I think like Joni Mitchell is under the influence of any male, you know, at, at any point. You know, her narrative, her narrative involves men, but it involves men in the way that men's songs often involve women, if that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah I well, think um, I think the other thing I was that I was just reminded of is that I think one of the main things I didn't like in this record was the production. Um, it just, it's, it, the, the album seemed very dated to me and I don't, and sometimes that's, that's not in and of itself a bad thing. It just, it wasn't, it just, it was that type of seventies production that was like with the orchestration and, um, you know, like, yeah, like the electric piano stands out a lot too. It, it just, it's kind of just boring to me. You know, it hmm. doesn't, there, there, there's very little edge. That's why I like the, what is it? The jungle line that had more of the edge to it. And so, um, you, you know, I, I just, I, it was just kind of falling in that camp of being this, you know, a generic 70s sound to me. And on one listen, I just, you know, like I said, I, by the end of it, I was just, I was good. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. I got it. You know, this is not my folk uh, singer songwriter type stuff and i do like a lot of that it's just uh, i can i'm gonna go elsewhere for that um and it's just but like i said she's she's clearly striking a chord with a lot of people and it's one of those things it's just it's just not striking a chord with me when was um blood on the tracks when did 75 that come out? okay same so, year yeah same year so as com for a comparison point i mean mm -hmm. that's in my mind that's kind of huh. the same sort of production in terms you know what's of... funny though? I look at Blood on the Tracks as the most personal album Bob Dylan did, no matter what he said. Whereas yeah. I view this as by far the least personal album that Joni Mitchell did. Ironically enough, she's it's like they reversed, right? Right. <laughs> Joni Mitchell usually writes these very personal albums, and this is a little bit detached. And then Bob Dylan usually writes these detached albums, and on this one, he's very personal. So it's kind of funny where they both ended up in 1975. Mm -hmm. So, plus yeah. I wonder too, Matt, if like just because we're hearing all these different types of music at this time, you know, with with not just like the kraut rock, but you know, everything else is kind of exploding in different genres, and this is kind of a return to form, almost like you know, which doesn't bother me in and of itself. There's yeah. plenty of stuff that you know, like one of my favorite things that we've done is in the seventies, earlier seventies, but Credence. You know what I mean? Like it's you, you can still, and they were even for the sixties. That was kind of like that wasn't that groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just a sound. It's just the overall sonic texture I'm getting here is just not my thing. I don't. I I wouldn't say that. I I think the production is similar. In, in this with Dylan, I think that you're getting much, I, I was getting more, I'm getting much more of a soft rock seventies kind of generic mm -hmm. sound here than I do with Dylan. Um, Dylan's album's much more, more produced than his previous ones. I would, I would agree with that, but uh, th th there's just something about this here. That's just not doing it for me. Gotcha. Fair enough. All right. So, all right. So it sounds like one recommend and two, not so much. I yeah. would agree with that. I'm I'm middling, so we're all we're kind of across the spectrum. I'd say this though: it's important to know that the strength of this album is the lyrics. And two mm -hmm. of my compatriots said they didn't really listen to the lyrics. And yeah. I do feel like 
to truly get an appreciation for this album, you need to listen to the lyrics because the lyrics are excellent. And, you know, I mm-hmm. haven't always connected with Joni Mitchell's lyrics, but they're very, very, very good on this album. So, yep. Doesn't mean it makes it pushes it into the like column for anybody, but it's, yeah. <laughs> I do think it's a piece. So, right. yeah. 